Welcome back to the Marshall Center Voices. I'm Valbona Zanelli. In this episode, we have the unique opportunity to have with us three serving U.S. ambassadors to the Western Balkans and hear their regional perspectives. Ambassador Yuri Kim, the U.S. ambassador to Albania. Ambassador Judy Reinke, the U.S. ambassador to Montenegro. And Ambassador Kate Marie Burns, the U.S. ambassador to North Macedonia. We're delighted the ambassadors visited us at the Marshall Center here in Garmisch Partakirchen and spoke at our Balkans History and Regional Analysis Seminar. Ambassadors, welcome to the Marshall Center Voices. Ambassador Kim, Ambassador Reinke, Ambassador Burns, we're delighted to have you with us today. It is such a rare opportunity to have with us three serving U.S. ambassadors from the Western Balkans here to discuss about the region. And it's fantastic to have three women diplomats that have stepped out front and showed the value and the importance of women in the security sector. I would like to start with you, Ambassador Kim. How would you describe the importance of the Western Balkans when we examine it from the larger Euro-Atlantic strategic picture? I think um, the Western uh, Balkans is the one big piece of territory that remains to be resolved in Europe. Um, as you know, when uh, the Soviet Union fell and the Berlin Wall came down, uh, we committed ourselves to a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. Um, and to get that right, we need to get the Western Balkans right. So I think you're seeing a, a stronger than ever commitment from the United States to helping the nations of the Western Balkans uh, to integrate themselves with each other. Um, and I think you will continue to see the United States pushing very strongly for um, uh, the uh, Western Balkans nations to be integrated into Europe, including through uh, membership in the European Union. Uh, this is great. All three countries that you're representing here are NATO members and are in the process of uh, European Union integration. What tools Ambassador Reinke has uh, the United States to use to ensure stability and security in the Western Balkans, considering also the current focus on strategic competition and the increased role of Russia and China in the region? Thank you, Val. I really appreciate the question. And the United States is very much committed to seeing uh, a, a Western Balkan region that really is part of Europe, as it always has been destined. Um, the tools that we have at our hand include things like um, our engagement with civil society, uh, our ability to train and modernize the military, since all three of our countries are members of NATO and are committed to the alliance. And um, all three of the countries are fighting to increase and improve uh, the rule of law. And we, the tools at our disposal there are um, training and um, investment in improving um, the judiciary, the, um, uh, the ability of judges to, to operate impartially and with uh, independence, and likewise uh, prosecutors who are well-trained and able to um, carry out their processes um, as uh, fully independent and impartial uh, prosecutors. And as part of those tools, uh, the president has uh, extended our ability to address corruption. Uh, in fact, uh, President Biden has widened the authority of the Western Balkan sanctions regime to include corruption. That's a new tool in our toolbox and the ability to address um, individuals in the region who operate with impunity. And um, uh, as we know, corruption tends to uh, erode the democratic institutions uh, that we care about. And therefore, I'm sure that this new tool will be one that we can uh, use to help strengthen the ability of the countries to fight corruption on their own territory. Well, thank you, Ambassador Reinke. Ambassador Burns, when we uh, discuss also about the challenges in the Western Balkans that impede the democratic progress and prosperity in the countries, how would you address them? What are some of the issues that you're seeing in North Macedonia in this case? I think, first of all, you have to focus on the positive. And again, if we're talking about a Europe whole, free, and at peace, and the Western Balkans as being an integral part of that, most powerful asset we have is the fact that the aspirations of the citizens, in this case of North Macedonia, but throughout the Western Balkans, 
are the same as ours, which is to see their countries become stable, multi-ethnic democracies that can provide prosperity and a better future for their children. And that future, as they've defined it, happens to be uh, fully embedded in European institutions like NATO and the EU. So when we look at how do we help accomplish that vision, the tools that we have are many. Um, we can focus on tackling some of the biggest challenges they have, which are nascent democratic institutions. So finding ways to strengthen those institutions, finding ways to combat corruption and strengthen rule of law so that courts can act independently, uh, that crimes can be prosecuted, so that citizens can hold their governments accountable, and then tackling some of the global challenges that the Western Balkans, like so many others, are facing, whether that's recovery from the pandemic, um, energy independence, uh, the need to revitalize their economy, to keep young people at home through new opportunities. All of these things we can address through positive example, through sharing of our best practices, and through support in uh, both international forums, but also day-to-day -day diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Kim, how do you see uh, Albania, but also the Western Balkans more broadly, part of the transatlantic solutions when it comes to strategic competition, when it comes to great power competition, and we discussed the role, increased role of Russia and China in the region. Yeah, well, as you know, uh, the Western Balkans is not new to the notion of strategic competition and great power competition. Um, and I think we all know uh, from our, uh, even someone with the most cursory knowledge of world history will be aware that the last time that the, there was great power competition in the Balkans, uh, it produced a world war. Um, and you could argue that it produced two world wars. But in any event, I think um, the nations of the Western Balkans are highly attuned to their role um, uh, and their potential victimhood uh, in great power competition. Uh, for Albania, they're quite clear on who their friends and their enemies are. And I think uh, in that respect, uh, Russia and China have uh, very little traction um, in, uh, in Albania. I think the uh, Albanian people have had their own specific experiences with these two countries and understand very well that their future belongs with Europe um, and more importantly, that their future belongs in partnership with the United States. Um, so uh, we'll continue to build on that. Thank you. Ambassador Reinke, what is your take? Um, I think that the great power competition does continue, and it has for, for eons in the Western Balkans. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, the independent countries of the Western Balkans won't find a place in a strong, stable European framework. Um, I mean, that's the vision that the United States has for Montenegro, uh, for the neighboring countries. And I think that uh, working together, we can help them build on, on the reforms that are needed to uh, acquire uh, EU uh, accession. Uh, we hope in the near future. And that doesn't mean a decade. That means in, in, within a reasonable time period so that uh, the countries that aspire to EU membership uh, can achieve that goal and achieve the prosperity that goes with it for its people. Ambassador Reinken, uh, Montenegro is a NATO member. What are some of the priorities that where the government in Montenegro and society in Montenegro needs to focus on to be as successful in the whole Euro-Atlantic integration, and I'm talking here about the EU integration of the country. Well, I think the country has um, made some good progress, and uh, it, it obviously needs to really build on the reforms. At the moment, I see some divisions in society that, that are, are challenging. Um, individuals shouldn't be forced to choose ethnic identities or otherwise um, dwell on issues of the past. Instead, I'd really like to build the civic center. I'd like to, prov to encourage um, individuals of diverse ethnic and um, religious backgrounds to all work together on a shared vision. And I think this can happen because Montenegro really is known for its multi-ethnic identity and um, the, the vision of a Montenegro taking its seat in the European Union is one the United States is pleased to support. Ambassador, you mentioned uh, Euro, European Union integration. Mm -hmm. I heard you uh, a few days ago talk about three priorities. What are the other priorities that you have as the UN, US ambassador in Montenegro? 
Well, obviously, we want to ensure that Montenegro is a strong, stable, and um, a contributing member to NATO. And we do all we can to help Montenegro achieve the modernization reforms needed. Uh, we also hope that Montenegro can be a strong uh, participant in solving regional and even global issues, such as uh, climate change and other um, challenges. Uh, Montenegro needs to be a contributor in that regard. And finally, we look for a prosperous Montenegro that um, uh, contributes to its own population and likewise can grow in trade and investment with the United States. I think that's a win-win for both of our countries. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Kim, you also have three priorities in Albania. <laughs> yes, they're well known. <laughs> Democracy, defense, and business. Um, and the reason I frame it that way uh, is because they're also interlinked. Um, when we talk about democracy, what we're really talking about is the rule of law, um, clean courts, uh, justice reform, the end of impunity, and the eradication of corruption. The second point is uh, on defense. We want a NATO ally that is capable of carrying its own weight in the alliance, um, an ally that is strong and secure and that is able to defend itself um, and contribute to the defense of, uh, of all allies. And then thirdly, um, business. There is no reason on earth that Albania should continue to be a poor country. Uh, it has a talented population. It has uh, incredibly uh, strategic geography. It has natural resources. Um, and I think that if you were to find a way to unleash the talent of uh, the people there, um, you would have a country that is at least uh, of medium wealth. And um, when you talk to Albanian people, um, what they generally tell you is that the greatest impediment to their decision to stay or, or go, um, their trust in uh, government, their willingness to invest. Um, the greatest impediment is corruption. And that's why we focus so much on uh, democracy uh, and the rule of law. So um, as we move forward on all three of those issues, um, uh, I think that you're gonna start to see a country that is fairer, that is stronger, um, and that is richer for most Albanians, all Albanians, hopefully. Thank you. Ambassador Burns, your priorities in North Macedonia? Well, I think it's no surprise. We've talked about how we look at the region and how important it is that the entire region be strong, prosperous, secure democracies. So uh, very similarly, we're very focused on ensuring that the newest member of NATO, NATO's 30th member, is one of its strongest. Uh, despite the size of its country, it's already contributing in a major way. And we want to see the success they've had in that defense element expand to the other areas of the political military alliance. So it is fulfilling all of the values that come with NATO membership and with that allegiance uh, and alliance with the West. Uh, secondly, we are very focused on democratic institutions. North Macedonia has made tremendous progress in its reform agenda. Uh, and it is responsive to a very diverse, multi-ethnic uh, society, now trying to offer the kind of citizen responsive government that those citizens rightly deserve and have asked for. And then when it comes to economic prosperity, uh, while it's a small country, it has some unique advantages uh, where it sits in the Western Balkans. And by encouraging not just uh, uh, greater opportunities for the private sector to grow, to build the economic prosperity that exists there, but also to have stronger ties to its regional neighbors um, and to increase opportunities for its young people so that those you know, years ago who chose to go to the United States or Europe to build their futures now choose to stay in North Macedonia and build their future at home. Mm -hmm. And create that environment also to attract more serious investment, foreign direct investment from the United States and other uh, Western European countries. Uh, you all mentioned defense uh, as one of your priorities. So I'd like to get your take on Defender Europe 21. Uh, the US-led uh, military exercise Defender Europe 21 was the first uh, exercise of this kind, uh, like large exercise, in the Western Balkans. So I'd like to get your takeaways regarding the strategic, you know, insight, the strategic takeaways from Defender 21. What was the impact that it had also in each of the countries that participated? And what are some of the lessons learned to prepare better for future exercises? And maybe we'll start with you, Ambassador Kim, since Albania was one of the bigger, you know, uh, countries that hosted, one of the countries that hosted the exercises. 
Thank you. And in fact, Albania hosted the most uh, activities as part of Defender Europe 21. You may know that uh, it's the largest U.S.-led multinational military exercise ever held in the Balkans. And the strategic value of that um, is uh, uh, manifold. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to demonstrate through these exercises to our adversaries, as well as to our friends and allies, that we're able to operate together effectively, quickly, respond to any crisis in a way that results in victory for us. So that's number one. The second thing is that uh, it helps us to work out uh, areas for improvement. I mean, that's the whole point of exercises, right? And once again, uh, it creates a, a, an opportunity to uh, improve our skills, our ability to work together, to move quickly. Um, this particular set of exercises associated with Defender Europe 21 involves moving troops um, and equipment from Central Europe, um, mainly from Germany, as you know, um, into Albania and to other countries uh, along the, the uh, Balkan coast, the Adriatic coast, and then also from CONUS. Uh, and the objective, of course, is to show how we get all of this, all of these people and this stuff over to the Balkans and then push everything up towards uh, the Black Sea. Always very useful to do, um, and uh, more important than ever to be able to demonstrate uh, that NATO uh, and its partners are able to uh, be uh, fully responsive uh, in a timely manner to any threat that might arise. Thank you. Ambassador Burns, how important was Defender Europe 21 for North Macedonia, NATO's newest member? Profoundly important. So Defender Europe 21, the decisive strike exercise, which is what took place in North Macedonia, was essentially North Macedonia's debut as a NATO ally. Uh, it was not only the most ambitious uh, exercise that had been ever hosted, 700 U.S. soldiers, 1,000 soldiers from North Macedonia, Greece, and Bulgaria. Um, it was a chance to showcase, not just to the fellow NATO members, um, and those who've invested so much in North Macedonia's growth, but essentially to the citizens of North Macedonia, what NATO membership looks like. It was an opportunity to showcase the Krivolak training area and all of the benefits that this additional capability provides the Alliance. Um, and I think it was a way to bring home, literally, uh, the fact that North Macedonia, once you know a source of instability perhaps, is now a contributor to regional security and is contributing in a major way to the wellness and the resilience of the Alliance. Thank you. Ambassador Ranke, so what was the level also of engagement of Montenegro in Defender Europe 21? I'm glad you asked about Defender 21. Um, Montenegro, which has just gone through a, a change of government last year, uh, did not end up hosting um, a, an exercise in country as originally planned, but there were some interesting and important takeaways. Um, for instance, the whole training and preparation aspect of the exercise was a really good learning opportunity for the Montenegrins working with us. And I think that was a, uh, it was valuable. We learned a lot from it. And I think uh, both countries, the United States and Montenegro, will be better prepared the next time around, which would be December uh, for Defender 23, and at which time uh, possibly Montenegro will be ready to host some element of that exercise in its own territory. In the meantime, I think it's worth noting that Montenegro, which acts as a, a bridge between um, uh, Europe itself uh, and the Balkan Peninsula, Peninsula was able to transport uh, troops and, and logistics um, through its territory without incidents. Um, this was a, a chance to highlight the fact of uh, interagency cooperation. The police and customs were able to communicate uh, with the, the Ministry of Defense um, and with the allies so that those movements of troops were quite smooth. So there really were some positives that came out of Defender 21. Maybe the missing element was a chance to showcase to the population of Montenegro really how, how wonderfully um, the Montenegrin government has been modernizing and enhancing the capabilities as part of its NATO commitment. Um, I'm very excited that Montenegro was able to uh, deploy eight of its newest um, joint light tactical vehicles. These are vehicles that it purchased over the last year. Um, these vehicles were deployed to Romania as part of one of the exercises called Sabre Guardian. So Montenegro was very much in evidence, and I think they proved 
to be a wonderful ally, and they're growing and learning together with us and the rest of the allies how to uh, carry out an exercise like this. And that is so important also to foster and strengthen the regional cooperation, which is really much needed mm -hmm. uh, in the Western Balkans. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the lessons learned from the previous Defender exercise that could be used for Defender 23? Well, the best lesson from Defender 21 for North Macedonia was you are a strong NATO ally and you're capable of hosting a complex um, international exercise of this statute as part of a broader NATO program. Uh, but I think there's also new opportunities uh, with Defender Year 23. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it will take place on the 30th anniversary of the state partnership program with Vermont. It'll be a great opportunity to highlight a partnership that has contributed so much to North Macedonia's transformation and its entry into NATO over the years. Um, but it's also a partnership that has now expanded into the economic and education and other spaces as well. And the second opportunity that Defender Europe 23 will provide is even greater opportunity for regional cooperation. And one of the things that Ambassador Rika mentioned was, um, was the joint light tactical vehicles mm -hmm. that Montenegro has procured. North Macedonia is also procuring JLTVs, but it's a year behind mm -hmm. uh, Montenegro more or less. So it's gonna be a real opportunity to be able to learn from Montenegro's experience, to benefit from seeing this equipment in, in, in the field and how it's used in these operations. And I think that's gonna have a huge positive impact, not just on the NATO alliance, but also on the countries of the region working together. Uh, to share their expertise and become mentors to each other. Ambassador Burns, I'm so glad you brought up the state partnership. So I'd like to hear from Ambassador Kim and Ambassador Reinke on your uh, partnerships. Well, I'm pleased to report that Albania also has a wonderful state partnership um, celebrating its 30th anniversary this year with the state of New Jersey. And um, that partnership, I think, has produced um, a lot of, uh, of uh, mutual benefit. Uh, uh, on the part of Albania, we've certainly uh, seen that country's defense capabilities increase, um, get uh, modernized in terms of uh, equipment. Um, and then on the part of New Jersey, the ability to develop partnerships that will enable U.S. forces to uh, operate more effectively in Albania and in the region is uh, tremendously valuable. So we're looking forward to expanding on that. Ambassador Reinke? Montenegro is a proud uh, partner of the Maine National Guard, which acts as its state partner program. Maine has been on the ground with Montenegro doing all kinds of training and uh, capacity building, uh, boots on the ground, wrenches in hand, fixing jeeps, building bivouac areas, and otherwise really helping to exercise the, the, the troops to learn how uh, we do it in the United States and also to learn from the Montenegrins. We also have brought in expertise from the state of Maine through the partnership program to address cybersecurity issues. In fact, we did cyber um, uh, security hunts to find um, any vulnerabilities in the cybersecurity framework of the Ministry of Defense. And most recently, we've brought in cyber experts from the state of Maine in order to sit elbow to elbow uh, addressing uh, cybersecurity. So I think there's so many ways uh, that we're still trying to explore where uh, a single state can bring in experts and really help uh, the country of Montenegro um, address the, the issues with live people that know the answers and have gone through the same challenge on their own, uh, in their own home country. And these partnerships are so important to foster that people-to-people -people connection uh, between you know, different states uh, in the U.S. and also uh, your country. And that's what we love about it. It, it, makes, uh, the, it makes the real partnership and the alliance uh, come to life as people meet each other and uh, they exercise together and they really do celebrate um, the alliance by being partners. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in the Western Balkans. There's been a tremendous progress in the last 30 years. But I'd like to move to another topic, and that is women, peace, and security. So I'd like to ask you, how do you see the progress in the region when it comes to women, peace, and security? We'll start with you, Ambassador Burns. Well, there has been important progress in North Macedonia for the simple fact that they have now adopted their first national plan on women, peace, and security. So that is moving forward. Um, I have a very strong examples of women in leadership uh, in North Macedonia, but we'd like to see more. Uh, so I think it is an area that continues to, to, to deserve some attention. Um, and that certainly comes 
true with deployments, exercises, putting women in those leadership roles, I think sends a strong signal uh, to women who are coming up through the forces that there's leadership opportunities available for them. Um, but the, the uh, opportunities for cooperation really are limitless. Um, and I think the most important thing when we talk about women, peace and security is not necessarily about giving women the opportunity to exercise their natural skills and leadership. It's about giving anyone who has those skills and leadership, the opportunity to be part of their country's future, uh, whether it's their military or their civilian side. Thank you, Ambassador Kim. Um, in Albania, I think it's a, it's a complicated picture. On the one hand, um, you know, the new government that was announced by P Prime Minister Rama is extraordinary for the fact that 75% of the cabinet are women. 12 out of 15, I think, 12 out of 16 extraordinary. And these are uh, all women who are uh, uh, extremely qualified, have uh, proven themselves to be effective, and uh, we're very pleased to be working very close with, closely with them. On the other hand, domestic violence remains an issue. Trafficking in persons, mostly girls, remains an issue. Um, and uh, misogyny in political language remains an issue. So um, these are not immutable and uh, we'll continue to work on them. Thank you, Ambassador Reinhardt. In Montenegro, I think it's uh, very important to note that women still face an uphill climb to be part of the um, uh, the political um, the political structure. Although right now a, a third of the uh, cabinet is uh, female, uh, there's still a lot of room for growth. Um, women do face um, a, a very um, male-centric, uh, pa uh, patriarchal society, but the women that are coming up and are acting as role models for, for younger women who come behind them are strong, they're capable, they're well-trained, they're articulate, and they're driven with ideals. So I see a great deal of opportunity for women to be included in public life and to be included in the security framework that we're discussing here today. Um, I do uh, want to con commit that the United States will work on those issues together with the women leaders, including uh, those challenges uh, of domestic violence, um, trafficking in persons, and the others that my colleague has re referred to. These are things that uh, really hold women back. And I think our male allies know that they want the women to be successful. We'll work together to make sure women can be in a leadership position and that all minorities can be in a leadership position in order to help Montenegro achieve its, its security future. So it's about opportunities. It's about having women there as stakeholders, not just as placeholders. But That's a wonderful way of putting it. <laughs> uh, you know that the Marshall Center has a large community of alumni in all your countries. So what will be the advice that you have for the Marshall Center alumni community? Let's start with uh, North Macedonia in terms of how they can support you and how they can support their own country in terms of strengthening rule of law, fight against corruption, uh, strengthen democracy in the country. Well, I'm really proud to say that in North Macedonia, we have one of the most active and impressive alumni groups uh, from the Marshall Center. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to work with them and to participate in the discussions that they're having on a range of topics affecting the security challenges that we are confronting today. Um, and I think, you know, the message that I would have for them is continue to do what you're doing. Um, they bring together voices from across the political spectrum. They bring in outside expertise, including from the region. And this enriches the conversation uh, that goes into what is eventually the policymaking of the country. So it's an extremely important role that they play as stakeholders, as voices, and as experts. And the second message I would have for them is work to mobilize some of the alumni associations in the region. You found a model of success. And I think uh, further integrating those discussions with the region will only pay off dividends for, for all of the alumni and for all of the region. In fact, the Alumni Association North Macedonia is one of the most active one and one of the most successful ones. And we'd like to thank you also and your country team for the support uh, that you have given them. Ambassador Kim, in Albania, we also have an alumni association. I think uh, Ambassador Burns has given some terrific advice. The only thing that I would add is, um, look, there is power and uh, there is inspiration in being around like-minded individuals. And as alumni of uh, the Marshall Center, um, 
everyone is united in their commitment to a strong transatlantic partnership. Um, the idea that uh, Albania and every country uh, in that partnership is, um, is valuable um, and uh, can contribute something. Um, and I think that uh, those who are Marshall Center alumni have a special role to play in all of that. Um, they've already been given a vote of confidence just by being selected for this program. And um, I think uh, we can all have uh, the hope that uh, these alumni will join forces and uh, try to make sure that Albania stays on the right path uh, towards a, a future uh, in Europe uh, and in partnership with the United States. Thank you. They have a role and a duty actually to play in uh, strengthening democracy and transatlantic relations. Uh, Ambassador Reinke. Um, I'm very proud that there is a very broad network of um, alums of the George C. Marshall Center in, Nor in uh, Montenegro. And they're in all the different key um, ministries and, and parts of the government and in, in public life. Uh, they're in the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Interior Ministry, Police, uh, and Academia and Civil Society and beyond. That's a wonderful network. And the th the strategic thinking that this institution helps to share and grow in all of the different uh, individuals when they participate in the programs is evident when you talk to them. They think more broadly. The alums, they, they think of the future. They don't dwell on the past. And what I really like is that they are helping each other. I think we should really grow our alumni network and bring it together so that each of them is really encouraged that there's a network and that there's a strong body of, of like-minded individuals who have the same Euro-Atlantic, transatlantic um, uh, viewpoint and uh, that they are stronger together. Uh, I'm happy to say that some of those individuals have risen to very high uh, positions within the government and are continuing to uh, pursue exactly that vision. And uh, I want to help them achieve that goal. And perhaps we at the Marshall Center should support uh, your uh, country teams also in strengthening the regional alumni association, because be I think these countries, you know, have these people uh, from all these countries have a lot to share with each other. Absolutely. That's one of the things about the Western Balkans. I think it is uh, a stronger, more stable region if we can lower the tensions between the countries, build the relationships. And I think those participants who've been at the George C. Marshall Center, who go back to their countries as alums, can contribute to that very vision of a prosperous Western Balkans that is whole, free, and at peace. That's the vision. Well, I just wanted to thank you so much and everybody here at the George C. Marshall Center for bringing the three of us here for a great day uh, of discussions. We had some really dynamic engagements. We all serve the United States in three very different countries which are unique in their own ways. But when it comes to the future, it's very clear that for all three of our countries, it's NATO and it's the EU. And we make the best efforts and the most progress by nurturing that strategic partnership that we have between the host countries and the United States. And it was great, I think, to come and have these kinds of discussions that only reinforce that strategic direction. Thank you, Ambassadors, for your leadership, and thank you what you're doing to support the Euro-Atlantic integration of the region. Ambassadors, on behalf of the Marshall Center and our audience, I would like to thank you very much for being with us today and taking your time to visit the Marshall Center. It's great that you could share with us your thoughts and important insights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Val. And this concludes this episode of the Marshall Center Voices. Until next time, stay tuned.